uh, Billy Graham used to tell this story about a time when he was in a town to, to do some preaching ministry, uh, and he wanted to mail a letter. He didn't know where the post office was, and so he ran into one of the uh, neighborhood kids, and he asked where he could find the post office. The, the, the kid gave him the directions, and uh, then Billy Graham thanked him for those directions, and, and then he said to the boy, you know, if you, if you come to such and such a church tonight, uh, I will tell you how you can get to heaven. The boy thought for a minute and said, how are you going to tell me how to get to heaven? You can't even get to the post office. <laughs> the passage that we are going to look at today answers that question. How do we get to heaven? How are we saved? And then it takes the next step and says, what does it look like when we are saved? We're going to take on those very important questions of faith this morning. How are we saved and what does it look like when we are saved? And we are going to get answers to those important questions from a very important event in the life of the church. If, if, if there was a test, then this would definitely be on the test. So I want to encourage you to uh, go to Acts 15 in your Bible. Acts 15 tells the story of something that's uh, often referred to, usually called the Jerusalem Council. And you'll find the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 in, in your Bible. Now, <clears throat> just prior to Acts 15, something really incredible has happened in, uh, in, in the life of faith. Something very important to us. God started to bring Gentiles into the family of, of faith. God started to bring non-Jewish people like us into his family. You know, for generations, going all the way back to, to Moses, to Abraham, really, God had talked about Israel as his own chosen nation, as his very own people. And since the earliest Christians were, in fact, Jewish, a lot of them thought that, well, the promises that Jesus answered uh, would be for God's chosen people, would be for Jewish people exclusively. But then, non-Jewish people, non-Israelite people like us, started to believe. You know, Peter in Acts 10 discovered this man named Cornelius and his family. They were Gentiles, and yet they responded to the gospel. They believed, and, and, and Peter saw the Holy Spirit come and, 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 and indwell uh, this Gentile person. And then Acts 14, Paul talks about the Israelite people rejecting him. And so he says, okay, I'm going to leave you guys and go to the Gentiles. And of course, they come in droves to faith. Because Paul knew, as we know from Acts 7, 8, 9, that Paul was chosen to be the mouthpiece of God to the Gentiles. That led to a really important question, too, really. Can Gentiles be saved? And do they have to become Jewish in order to be saved? Do they got to conform to the law and tradition of Hebrew people? To answer that question, the church gathered together in Jerusalem, and what we know as the Jerusalem Council happened. They gathered together to discern God's will and to figure out how we are saved. So you can see there, Acts 15, verse 6, it says, All of the apostles and the elders gathered together. They met to consider this question. Verse 7, I'm going to pick up there. After much discussion, Peter got up. And he addressed them. He said, brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the gospel, the message of the gospel, and believed. God, who knows the heart, showed them that he, ex uh, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He's probably thinking of Cornelius here. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. 
Now then, why do you try to trust, test God by putting on the necks of disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers could be able to bear? No. We believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. You know, Peter's appealing to two things here. He's appealing to his own experience where he saw Gentiles genuinely come to faith and, and believe. Second, he's appealing to the reality that, that not even their you know, treasured, honored forefathers could keep the law without God stepping in. And so he takes those two pieces of evidence and says, look, <clears throat> this is what's happening. God uh, is saving people, and it is through belief in the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved. That's verse 11. We believe it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved just as them. That's a, that's a crucial statement. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. We are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus. So Peter finishes his bit, Paul and Barnabas get up, they talk about their experience with the Gentiles, and then finally James, who is Jesus' brother, gets up to weigh in. Uh, and he points out that, that God himself had said in the Old Testament that he would bring Gentiles into his family. You can see that verses 15 through 18. But then he concludes, verse 19, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult or onerous for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should not pile on extra restrictions, he says, where God has made no restrictions. This is a crucial moment in Christianity. You know, James seconds Peter's statement that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, not by law but by turning from sin and trusting the Savior Jesus. We receive the grace of God. Grace is God's free gift to us. It's so important that the church drew the line in the sand here and said, this is how it works, by faith. However, James says, being saved should make a difference in your life. You know, we don't do good deeds to try to make God uh, like us. He gives grace to us freely. But when we receive it, we don't go on living the kind of life, the indulging in the sin that we used to. We give ourselves to living in light of the grace that God has given. And so he says, verse 20, uh, he says, uh, Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Probably sounds weird to us, but really what he's saying is, Jews and Gentiles alike are saved by faith. We should not go back to the life that we had before, which for many was characterized by idolatry, that's the idols and the animals and the blood, and immorality. That stuff is old news. Idolatry, immorality, that belongs to your old way of life. Now that you are saved, leave it behind and get on with living the good, godly, new life that God has given. And so they write all this down and send it off with Paul and Barnabas to circulate all throughout the Mediterranean world. Now, what does this mean for us? I think I would uh, really boil this, uh, this passage down to this. We are saved by grace to live grace-filled lives. We are saved by grace to live gracious lives. Let me explain. We are, we, we are saved by grace. This is absolutely fundamental. We are saved by grace, through faith, not by the works that we do, but by the lavish generosity of God. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done in your old life. You could be the worst of sinners, and yet the grace of God comes in and wipes it away. Not because of who you are, but because God is, is lavishly grace, gracious. You are a treasure to God because of his grace. 
and and that grace is available to us as as gentiles you know we're so used to thinking about christianity as a as a as a not jewish thing and yet it was not a foregone conclusion in the first century that people like us could in fact be saved I mean, I think you can point to a lot of places in the Old Testament that, that anticipate God saving Gentiles like us. Uh, I mean, going back as far as Abraham saying, I will bless the nations through you. And yet it is so important that Peter and Paul and James, the Jerusalem Council here met and affirmed that indeed God wanted to save Gentile people like us. They confirmed what God was already doing, saving people from all ethnic backgrounds by faith. We don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to follow Jewish law. We don't have to make up for our old way of living to prove that we are worthy of salvation. When we believe God saves us, that's how we get to heaven. <laughs> that's grace. We are saved by grace, but we need to live in light of that. We're saved by grace to live grace-filled lives. It should make a difference in our lives. Our lives should be different from the way they were before. This grace should want to make us, uh, should make us want to be more and more like the God who has graciously saved us. Right? The Jerusalem Council will point to immorality and, and, and idolatry and say, stay away from those because those are inconsistent with the grace that God has shown to you clearly uh you know temple uh temple prostitutes and strangle animals are not going to be a problem to us but those uh those expressions of immorality uh those the immorality and idolatry that are expressed there in this passage like that strangle animals and immorality they find expression in our lives too right selfishness power pornography pride all of these things are things that belong to the past our old way of life we want nothing to do with them now that we are saved by grace Are you intentionally living in light of the free gift of grace that God has given you? We are saved by the grace of Jesus to live grace-filled lives. So really, I want to send you uh, away from this passage with, with three thoughts. First, the importance of the Jerusalem Council here in Acts 15. You know, we are here we can be here as a church because these people wisely affirmed what God was doing, freely saving people like us. Second, God freely saves sinners. It is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved, as Peter said. And third, we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus to live grace-filled lives reflecting that goodness of God back into the world. We are saved by grace to live grace-filled lives. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this free gift of grace that is available to us. Lord, thank you that, that you have extended it to us as, as Gentiles. You know, the, there was a time in the history of the family of God when there was a a barrier that we would not cross. If we tried to cross to get closer to you, we would be slaughtered on the spot. But Lord, you have invited us now into your family. Sinners, outsiders now sit at your family table. And God, thank you that you give us this grace freely no matter what we have done in the past, no matter who we were, Lord, when we receive your grace, we become a brand new person. Thank you for, for, for not making us uh, accrue a giant list of good deeds to outweigh our bad. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to pay for that sin, to wipe it away so that we can be brand new. Lord, I pray that you would help us to feel that forgiveness in our hearts. And I pray that it would spill out into our lives. 
that, that, that we would overflow with joy and, 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 and grace knowing that you have poured your blessing in us. God, I ask through this week that you would help us to see um, how to live in light of grace. Give us moments where we stop and say, wait, is this consistent with the grace that I've been shown? And Spirit, come alongside us to, to carry us out of evil, to carry us out of temptation, to live in ways that are consistent with the grace that you have shown to us. Lord, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen.